as of um, actually the end of this month <laughs> with the Iowa Foundation full time. I've been working with them behind the scenes for the last year. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what I do kind of as we go um, through what Iowa is. Um, so, um, but basically, this is me. Um, you can just call me Julie. And if you speak German to me, please say do and not me because that just makes me feel really old. Um, <laughs> so so um, I have been in fact in the, in the blockchain space since 2012, which at the time meant Bitcoin, um, and uh, kind of growing up uh, with the technology and seeing various different waves of new things coming along. Really exciting stuff. So my background is I'm a lawyer and an economist, and um, I became really fascinated by the potential for at the time Bitcoin, and later other blockchain technologies to really be used for um, financial inclusion applications and for other things that would help us integrate people into the world economy who are currently excluded by sort of centralized systems. Um, so that was what actually drew me into the space in, in the beginning. And then as I started to get into you know, reading, reading about the technology on chat forums and um, all kinds of sort of dark back channels of the internet where you find information and uh, used to find information in the early days about the projects. Um, lots and lots of really fascinating policy questions just kept coming up that I, as an academic, uh, teaching at Duke Law School at the time, found fascinating and wanted to look at more in depth. Um, so I started to think about it, well, what does this actually mean for uh, financial regulation? <laughs> what does it mean for international trade policy? What does it mean for uh, money laundering? What does it mean for privacy uh, and data protection and things like this? And then we started to see all kinds of things happening like Mount Gox, the you know, famous the blow up of the Mount Gox exchange, which was only really the first of many <laughs> uh, disasters and exchanges, lots of fraud and consumer protection uh, questions arising. Um, but also then central banks getting into the conversation being, and being very curious about the technology, starting to say, hmm, well, you know, we don't think that this is a threat to our monetary policy at this point in time, but um, it certainly seems to be something that's of interest. People seem to be really keen to have some sort of a money system that is not controlled by government, so we should probably pay attention to this and see what the, where this is going, what the potential is here. So um, lots of fascinating questions which um, perfectly lend themselves to be uh, analyzed from the perspective of both economics and law. And as I, I went through uh, my journey through this space, I, I really started to learn that the way that the technology is designed from the inside, in terms of its inbuilt economic incentives, um, and the way that its governance structure is set up, who can make decisions about changes to the code, who can influence the development of the technology, how are those decisions made, um, who profits from it, etc. Those decisions, which are design decisions, very much influence the legal and regulatory questions that come out on the other end, uh, because different design setups lead to different types of implications. So that's not about me. Um, IOTA. Um, so what is IOTA? So IOTA is not a blockchain. IOTA is um, a distributed ledger technology that was designed for the Internet of Things. So the idea is that we are moving more and more uh, toward this world where we have an economy of things. Uh, lots of interconnected things with chips in them, sensors, uh, devices, um, that are all sort of connecting and, and talking with one another, exchanging data, exchanging information. And now, with, since the advent of blockchain technology, uh, it becomes possible also to exchange payments uh, directly across devices and to exchange payments for data <laughs> in various different ways. Uh, payments as data. Um, so the question in designing IOTA that the, the, the co-founders asked themselves when they were thinking about this, uh, conceptualizing it in 2014 and then, and then into 2015 was, what, is, what happens when you combine blockchain with the Internet of Things? And the, um, the observation that they made, which is something that has become even more acutely um, obvious in the past couple of years, is that you know, blockchain has a bit of a bottleneck problem. You have a bunch of transactions that are broadcast uh, in a blockchain, they get batched, they get confirmed through the process of mining in, in a proof of work or proof of stake setup, um, which means that they all kind of come through this sort of a centralized point, which is economically incentivized by the creation of new coins uh, in most systems. And then the ledger kind of builds on itself block by block uh, in, in, a, in a linear fashion. And this is a bottleneck, as we all saw with CryptoKitties uh, last year, right? 
So I used to do, when I would give talks about what's blockchain and why is it cool and how does it work, I used to always do a, a demo, a live demo for the audience where I would take someone through um, uh, just setting up quickly an Ethereum, opening up an Ethereum account, uh, just a wallet, and like Jax or something that's super easy you can sign up for in 30 seconds or 60 seconds. And then I would send them some ether from my smartphone, uh, you know, some lucky person in the audience, and it would usually arrive uh, on the person's phone you know, 30 seconds later or something like this. <laughs> but with CryptoKitties, I actually <laughs> tried to send a transaction when, when this uh, app called CryptoKitties uh, was built on Ethereum and became super popular and the blockchain just became totally clogged with hundreds and hundreds of people trying to buy CryptoKitties. Um, and all the transactions had to go through this bottleneck. And it actually took really, really long time to confirm transactions during the CryptoKitties phase. So um, this goes up and down if you look at the statistics on, on confirmation rates. It differs, of course, for different blockchains. It's different from, the, from Bitcoin to Ethereum. It's also different. Uh, in, in private or permissioned systems, it's a much different setup, so you, you can get rid of this, um, this confirmation time problem, um, but not in an open public permissionless set. So the idea behind the tangle, that uh, originally idea behind the tangle was, let's see if we can come up with a distributed ledger technology that is lightweight, that is open and permissionless, uh, but that doesn't have this bottleneck problem of creating a chain. Um, and so, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a good joke, but it's a blockchain without the blocks with a chain. And it looks like this, <laughs> basically. So it's called the Tangle, and these are just nodes. Um, we call them we call them tips if they haven't been confirmed yet. So in IOTA, basically, instead of going through this batching process uh, with confirmation happening through mining, um, instead, anyone who wants to send a transaction on the network, they send it out to the network. And in order for their own transaction to become eligible for confirmation, they have to do a small amount of proof of work to confirm up two other transactions near them. Near being a, a vague concept. <laughs> so, so you have some, a bunch of unconfirmed un, uh, tips, and then you have confirmed ones, you have to confirm two others, and then your own transaction becomes elig eligible <laughs> to be confirmed itself, and, and therefore added to the tangle. So, um, you can see that this is not a chain. It's an asynchronous network. Um, it can grow all over in all the different parts of the tangle at the same time. And in fact, it's not, it's not a linear thing like this, is the way that it's depicted on the slide, because you could also have unconfirmed transactions over there, or over there, or over there. Um, it's based on a mathematical concept uh, called uh, directed acyclic graphs. If you want to read the Tangle white paper, um, by all means do. It's super, super hard to get through. <laughs> it's super hard to get through because it's basically a theoretical math paper. And one of the things that, um, that unfortunately you don't learn from the current version of the, of the IOTA white paper is exactly how it's implemented on the, the live IOTA network. Because here, with this setup, you have uh, some nice properties, which I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes but you also have new problems that you have to solve that are not present in blockchain in terms of security um, and, and other things. So IOTA's main features. Uh, basically, similar to blockchain, data security. Uh, all data are cryptographically secured in the Tangle and the, the data can be made visible to certain parties uh, upon um, releasing it with your private seat. Um, you can do machine-to-machine -machine payments. So machines can pay each other for services and resources or data. There are no transaction fees because there's no mining. Um, now, recently it's been pointed out that there is, a, there is at least some amount of transaction fee because each node has to do this small amount of proof of work to have its own, uh, have its own um, transactions confirmed. That's true. Um, comparatively speaking, though, so right now, I, I didn't look at the website today, but the estimate, the last estimate that I saw about the amount of resources that you need to confirm a Bitcoin transaction was somewhere around um, uh, the amount of electricity that you would need to power 10 US households for a, for a day. So to confirm one Bitcoin transaction. That's a lot of cost that we're putting in, uh, in terms of resources and electricity. Uh, not great for the environment. Um, and the amount of work that you have to do in this sort of IOTA setup is uh, it costs fractions of a penny to do this proof, proof of work. So it's much, much, much cheaper. But technically, it's not free. <laughs> very, very close to free. Um, so you, you send one cent worth of IOTA, and one cent arrives on the other side. There's nothing deducted in the form of mining fees. 
Um, so the other thing that is a feature of the Tangle is that it was designed to scale in this sort of organic, messy way, as the picture shows of the Tangle. Um, what we found with public permissionless blockchains is that uh, usability goes down. Uh, they're, they're not very scalable because of this block, this uh, bottleneck problem. So usability, user friendliness, as the CryptoKitty story shows, goes down the more the more people use them. Uh, the Tangle, on the other hand, is uh, the mathematical setup is such that it should get faster as more people use it because you have more tips who could potentially confirm yours. Um, so uh, you should get a higher transaction throughput um, along the way. I'm saying should because again, this is a theoretical math paper. And obviously in the real world, there are different types of limitations, right? You have limitations about the computational power of devices. You have uh, limitations about making sure that the devices can't be spammed with fake transactions from other parts of the network that they, that they can't see. So, um, so let me go back to this picture for a second. So as a result of this, and the fact that you have all these transactions kind of being added to the network everywhere all at once, and not being confirmed in a central way as you have in, in proof of work mining or proof of stake mining, um, you need some sort of a way to coordinate the system so that you don't have some nodes over here uh, trying to spend the same money at the same time as some nodes over there because they don't see each other's transactions. Right. So at the moment, um, IOTA has a, a, a system in place called the coordinator, which essentially places milestones on the blockchain, uh, on the tango rather, <laughs> places milestones that the transactions have to reference in order to, um, in order to have their, in order to be considered valid and confirmed. It's open source, as I said, that the coordinator is optional. You can go in, if you're a developer, you can turn it off. Um, and just use the, the network in the way that it's originally conceived of in the white paper. Um, nobody does this in practice because of the security threat of not being able to have visibility of, of if there's a double spend attack happening on the other side of the tangle um, at this point in time. So right now there's this coordinator in place that, that places these milestones that get referenced, and that is sort of the a second layer of validation to prevent the, the double spend and 51% attack problems. But, um, the roadmap calls for the decentralization um, and then eventual um, phasing out of the coordinator. And this is an active area of research. I can't get a lot of details on it for two reasons. One, um, I, I don't really understand it fully. <laughs> and two, uh, two, it's an active area of research, and so um, we're keeping it also while we're experimenting with it a little bit more under wraps. Um, but basically, the, the idea uh, from a conceptual <coughs> level is that the coordinator can be replaced with, um, with a, a form of economic clustering where people that you transact with often will become more trusted parties to you because you establish a sort of a history or a trusted relationship with them. So you weight their confirmations more highly uh, than others who are just randomly joined the tank whom you've never transacted with before. And then there are um, experiments running, uh, simulations running around swarm logic to figure out um, what are the attack vectors and in which circumstances do these, uh, do these approaches break down. That's all I can really say about that for now. Okay, so why should humans care <laughs> about DLT plus IoT? Because uh, I, I titled the presentation um, Empowering Humans Through Things. So one of the things that I learned quickly uh, when I started talking about blockchain is that a lot of people would, um, would present at conferences and they would say, this is fantastic, we're gonna disintermediate everybody, right? <laughs> we're gonna disintermediate the banks, we're gonna disintermediate stock exchanges, we're gonna disintermediate Uber, we'll have Uber without Uber, we'll have everything without any company in the middle, right? And the, the, the buzzword was disintermediation. But the reality is, you and I, in our everyday lives, if you go home and you sit down for dinner with your grandmother, and she asks you, well, what did you do today? Uh, you know, or what, what do you do in your career? You're gonna say, well, you know, I am so proud of what I do, I disintermediate, <laughs> right? Um, because we don't care about disintermediating, we care about connecting as people. And we want to actually come together and do useful things. We want to work on a global scale without artificial barriers keeping us from being able to do that. So really it's not about out with the old rage against the machine. Uh, it's more about connecting in a human way. So what can you do um, if you connect IoT devices up in a permissionless innovation ecosystem? Well, um, we've heard a lot of use cases 
uh, discussed already at the conference about autonomous economic agents. So your things can do deals with each other. <laughs> your car can pay for its parking space. Um, your car can get uh, over-the-air software updates from the manufacturer of the car to make, uh, it, can, it can communicate with other cars on the road when we start moving toward uh, self-driving cars and autonomous uh, vehicles, um, all kinds of things like that. Um, skip digital twins. Um, and, and basically, you can think of this in, in, in terms of figuring out how to uh, bring all of the cool data that we have in the real world into a digital representation that we can then do something useful with on a distributed ledger. And that's the, the, the basic problem that IOTA is trying to solve. How can we make, help all of these edge devices, which actually are very small devices and don't have a lot of processing power, so we can't actually expect them to do huge computations with lots of uh, you know, big, run big smart contracts or big code, essentially. They just don't have the processing power for it. So we need to figure out how to get that data into a form that others can then come along and use. Um, and we want to do it in a secure way. We want to do it in an encrypted way. We want to do it in a way that allows the end user, the person who provides the data, to control what happens with the data after the fact. So you can connect sensors, essentially, to the cloud via IOTA um, and make micropayments on very, very small, weak devices. Um, Cloud, by the way, is also, I was just talking uh, with, sorry, I forgot your name. Yes, Heiko from, <laughs> exactly, Heiko from BMW a few minutes ago. And cloud here, uh, don't take that literally, it, it can be sort of fog and mist computing as well for those of you who are moving more in the edge computing direction. Um, so if you want to, if you want to play with this, if you're a developer, uh, there is a live uh, data marketplace that you can go and play around with on the IOTA testnet, where you can set up a sensor. Uh, there's a set of onboarding tools that you can download and, and try out. And you can set up a sensor, whatever kind of sensor you want, and onboard it to the data marketplace, and then you can exchange data back and forth with the other participants in the data marketplace. You can pay them fake IOTA testnet tokens <laughs> to, for, for access to their data, et cetera, just to sort of learn how it works. Um, don't put anything <coughs> on there that is not already publicly available data. <laughs> um, because there are data privacy issues as well. So um, this is running right now and a number of companies, academic institutions and others are experimenting with this and just trying to learn what is possible. Um, so we also heard about how a lot of things, people don't want to own things anymore. They just want to use them when they need them and not have them sitting around just taking up space the rest of the time. So one cool thing that you can do with distributed ledger technology, if our things can talk to each other and pay each other, is we can phase out ownership. We can uh, do all these car sharing services, bike sharing, et cetera, et cetera, um, where our devices just pay for the use. Um, and one thing that's important to mention about this, let's see if I have, yeah. So here, uh, here's an example of a, of a proof of concept that was built um, together with Energy and uh, Volkswagen and BigchainDB called CarPass, where the car has an IOTA wallet um, and pays for electric charging, essentially. And now um, IOTA is developing a um, sort of a, a flagship kind of an experiment called Oslo to Rome, where um, we are going to basically have a car drive from Oslo to Rome, an electric vehicle. One of the big problems with buying an electric vehicle, even if you're super environmentally friendly, is that the range isn't very big yet, right? And then you have to stop and you have to recharge. And the public infrastructure for recharging is not very uh, well developed yet. So you have to plan really tedious routes <coughs> to figure out uh, to be at the right place at the right time when your battery is going to run out. Um, so what you can do instead, though, is you can take advantage of all the people who have private charging stations for their own electric vehicles sitting in their garage or their driveway at home. They're off at work. They're not using their charging station. So wouldn't it be fantastic if you could just stop by, charge your car, and, and keep going? Um, this is possible if the charging station also has an IOTA, uh, an IOTA wallet. Um, it's just a smart meter, basically. You're trading electrons for IOTA tokens, and then the tokens you exchange into whatever currency it is that you want um, via, via a secondary market. Um, next big challenge. Uh, one of the things that is neat about the Tangle design uh, is that it's also what's called partition to tolerant, which means it can run also offline. 
um, and split off from the main network and then rejoin um, later. And this is also a difficult technical problem to solve because once you have uh, once you have a part of a network go off and partition, you have to figure out how to make sure that when it comes back onto the main net that you don't have conflicts between transactions that have been confirmed at the same time. This is another reason that, um, that economic clustering and swarm logic is in, an important area of research for IOTA. Um, but theoretically this is possible and you can also run IOTA because it is in fact a low processing power protocol. You can run it over Bluetooth, Theoretically, you could run it over shortwave radio or any other kind of um, transmission spectrum that, um, that allows you to, 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 do, to do transmissions over short distances. Um, so you can do it in an asynchronous way. You don't have to have a constant power supply um, or constant internet access. A couple of examples. What would that maybe look like in practice? So right now we're working with an organization called Refunite. And Refunite was started by uh, two Danish brothers about 10 years ago, to help refugee families uh, relocate their family members after they had been separated in conflicts, essentially. So you flee a conflict um, under extreme circumstances, obviously. You don't usually have identity documents with you. Maybe you end up in <coughs> Camp A in you know, one country, and your brother ends up in Camp B in another country. The Mickelson brothers actually met a guy who this happened to, and he was trying to find his brother. And he wasn't having any luck doing it through the systems that are, that are managed by the UN and the Red Cross, um, simply because you know, they have very old school kind of legacy systems with very traditional databases that don't talk to each other. And you might, your, your brother might be literally at a camp down the road from the one you're in, but you would, you would never know it, right? It would take you years maybe to find out that, that simple piece of information. So they have, were doing a lot of work trying to help, the, help refugees track their families and come back into in touch with them sooner. They gathered a lot of data about refugees and how they move from camp to camp and what kinds of patterns, people patterns you see in movements from crisis situations to refugee camps to resettlement and whatnot. And they were trying to figure out how to use this data in a strategic way to help people reconnect faster. So they said, okay, um, they, they stumbled across IOTA, I have no idea how. And they said, um, you know, this could be interesting because we would like to figure out if we can use some sort of an opportunistic mesh net to help refugees reconnect with their families because they don't have identities, but usually they do have cell phones. Or within a short period of, of getting into a camp, it's one of the first things that people acquire with the limited resources that they have is a phone. Um, so if you have a phone and you're in a refugee camp, you have a couple of problems. One, you may not have internet access. Uh, you may be in a remote location where you don't have you know, uh, good coverage, satellite coverage, or cell coverage, or whatever. Um, so it may be fairly intermittent. Uh, and you might have to go to a specific <coughs> place within the camp and pay on a per, per um, kilobyte basis for, for the data that you, that you send or receive. And two, you don't necessarily have constant electricity supply, which means you can't keep your phone charged up all the time. Um, so, but they, they had this really um, innovative idea, and they said, maybe we could use the Bluetooth function of uh, phones to allow refugees to try and pass messages uh, to family members. Hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm in this camp looking for so-and-so. And an aid worker arrives at Camp A and hands out some packets or whatever. The message jumps from the person's phone to the aid worker's phone. The aid worker the next day is at a different camp. It jumps from that person's phone to other people's phones. And then the message kind of gets spread in an opportunistic way um, and eventually finds its way into the, into the target of A's brother. Um, so this is the idea that they have, and um, currently working on figuring out if, if that's possible to make that happen. Really cool stuff, right? That wouldn't have been possible without a distributed ledger technology um, to somehow connect devices and information. And the, the, piece, the economic piece is also really interesting here because you have this problem with paying for data and for charging. But if people can earn money from passing, from participating in the program, they earn IOTAs, for letting their phone be used to transmit data, and then they can go and pay with those iotas at some camp uh, store, a canteen or a tabak or whatever the word is, uh, um, where they can exchange that for M-Pesa or for Tigo or for whatever it is, vouchers, humanitarian aid vouchers, to buy things, then, then uh, they can also pay uh, the cost of charging up their phone and of buying data. Um, another example, I think this is my last one. Yeah, and then I'll just say something about how you can get involved. So, um, 
Another cool example, something that came out of the UN Hack for Climate, actually, which happened at the, at the Bonn climate change negotiations in, or in parallel to, uh, in November, here in, in Germany. Um, so there were a bunch of teams from all over the world that came together to hack on all blockchains, it wasn't specific to a particular blockchain, uh, just come up with solutions that would address climate change problems using blockchain technology. And the winner of that competition was a team called Game Forest, that basically um, developed a tool that uses satellite imagery and machine learning in order to predict what areas of forest are at risk for deforestation next. Um, and then they wanted to use a blockchain solution to then uh, pay caretakers who live in those forests to um, have to take care of the forest and not uh, and see to it that it doesn't get chopped down or burned or whatnot. Um, there are already existing programs, by the way, to transfer funds through various organizations under the Red Plus program of, of the UN uh, to populations living in rainforests precisely for this reason. So this is just a different way of doing it, uh, maybe in a slightly more efficient way. So, um, so now we are currently working with some with Game Forest and some partners uh, to identify <coughs> potential on the ground places where we could test this idea. Um, you don't. Uh, you'd, you don't need sensors if you have satellite imagery, right? You can just directly um, take the satellite data. But um, the feedback that we got from the, from the people who manage caretaker programs on forests is that actually satellite data is not good enough and they need sensors in the forest as well. In particular, they need smoke detectors because often um, clear cutting happens uh, in the middle of the night when someone gets paid to sneak in and set a fire or something like that uh, because the land will then be converted to a, a profitable farming use. Um, so they need smoke detectors, and they need other kinds of sensor data. Um, so this is a really cool and very, very challenging problem to solve. It'll be interesting to see um, if, if we're able to, to make this work in, in one of these four uh, areas that we're looking at as potential test beds. Um, but there's funding for this. You know, development agencies want to fund this. Governments want to fund this. There's a lot of funding for climate mitigation issues. So and this is something that, that clearly would make a big impact on the entire world because we have to preserve the carbon sinks of the rainforests and other types of forests. Okay, how can I get involved? As in you. So uh, start building stuff that solves shared global problems uh, is the best advice I can give. If you are not a developer, um, you have lots of other opportunities. I mean, this is a, a, a conference really specifically <laughs> targeting the involvement of more women in blockchain. And if you look around the room here, you wouldn't think that that's a problem, but if you go to any other blockchain conference, you would know right away that that is a big problem. We have very, very few women in this space. Um, but actually, we need lots of skill sets uh, to make this kind of thing work. Um, you know, something like the last two projects I just talked about, yes, you need developers, but you also need project managers, people who just know how to talk to different partners and bring them together and bring them from A to B to C all the way down to Z. You need communications people who are able to speak um, you know, publicly about these kinds of things and write press releases and things like this to build excitement in projects. Um, so IOTA has recently, in 2017, in November of 2017, we incorporated a non-profit foundation here in Germany, it's headquartered in Berlin, to steward the development of the technology. And there are kind of three core streams within the foundation. One is core development, uh, further technological research uh, on, on the main uh, tangle. The second is kind of a research, future projects research stream, which is looking at stuff like, like the swarm logic that I mentioned in economic clustering and a, um, um, an internet of things type version of smart contracts. Uh, how, how can you do sort of something similar to smart contracts on tiny devices with low processing power? Um, so those are some of the things within the research stream. And then the third area is adoption. Um, working with industry partners to solve problems that they have, working with governments to, um, to look at things like identity, um, e-governance services, etc., and then working with NGOs um, and partners like Game Forest and Refunite to, to help solve sort of developing world problems under the social impact stream. So that's, that's my ambit as director of social impact and the thing that I'm most excited about. Um, we are a nonprofit foundation and headquartered in Berlin. This is the only <laughs> nonprofit foundation so far that's ever been successful in registering in Germany, so we're really, really proud of the fact that we actually are registering in Germany. Um, it took about a year and a half to register the foundation in Germany. It wasn't an easy <laughs> process. It certainly would have been easier to go to Zug or to go to Singapore or somewhere else. But um, 
we really think that it has a huge advantage to be here in the heart of the European Union because it's a signal that uh, we have very strong regulatory oversight, we have a lot of regulation compliance stuff that we have to satisfy, and we want to make sure that, um, that we do things properly and that the partners that we work with are also comfortable working with us knowing that we're not some fly-by-night operation in Gibraltar. Um, that could disappear overnight, right? So, so that was the reason for doing it. Um, and the, the foundation was funded actually by donations from the community. So they were volunteer do donations. There wasn't a, a withhold a reserve set aside during the, the token generation event. Um, the tokens were completely sold uh, to community members and then uh, there was an invitation, anyone who wants to help set up a nonprofit foundation sends myotas to these addresses. And amazingly, um, the community really responded in, in a big way and sent about 5% of all existing IOTA tokens, which at the time were basically completely worthless, <laughs> um, but now are um, uh, over $250 million, or 250 million euros worth. Um, so it's a significant amount of money. And, um, and we were able to also not only become registered in Germany, but also um, we are very fortunate to be working with Deutsche Bank uh, so the IOTA Foundation is also the first crypto client ever to get a bank account with Deutsche Bank, which is also really great. Um, so there's an ecosystem fund. If you want to build something uh, and help build IOTA and uh, you have a cool idea like the Nicholson brothers did or the Game Forest, um, you can apply. Just send an application uh, over the website. We're currently redoing the website, but there will be a much clearer page for applying to the ecosystem fund. Uh, we have a portfolio manager who will evaluate all the grants. And, um, and give out grants to people who want to build stuff. And this is how you can contact me. Happy to take some questions. Anybody want to ask any questions about IOTA, Internet of Things? Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated about all the projects and the tutorials that you have uh, shown. And it's not actually a question that I have, um, but I do have a social project with a, a strong social impact, and um, I can see the possibilities on this, and I would love to apply for that. So. <laughs> Great, look forward to seeing the application. Yes, okay. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, yeah. we're hiring in a massive, massive way. <laughs> really, really, really need more people. There were about nine people uh, who sort of developed this over the course of two years in very grassroots sort of Slack channels and stuff. And now we have about 40 people and we'd like to grow to around 100 by the end of the year. And we need people with all kinds of skill sets. We're looking very, very intensively, actively looking for a chief communications officer. So if you're really good at communicating, uh, please send a resume. <laughs> um, and we would love to hire women, of course. Uh, we need a CFO also, somebody who really likes answering difficult questions about how crypto things are taxed and accounted for and things like that. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of uh, also operational and logistical positions. Um, as well as obviously developers, researchers, and project managers. I do have a tiny question. Yep. Do you have um, a report about this um, this project that you showed, where we No, it no, it's still no. It's still really. I mean, we're still in sort of scoping out the. There, as I mentioned, a lot of technical questions to be answered. <laughs> so, unfortunately, no. Everyone just wants to go home. <laughs> so no questions anymore. Thank you very much for your talk. In the back, maybe just one. Regarding the application, it's only Wait for the microphone, please. Regarding the application, it's only for uh, non-profit or also for startups? Oh, no, no, also for startups, yeah. The Ecosystem Development Fund uh, will will consider funding anything that is an interesting idea that builds on the tangle. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. What kind of criteria do you have for uh, yeah, so we have a, we're setting up a due diligence process 
to review. Um, obviously, we look at the feasibility of the proposal, uh, like the background of the person who's proposing it. So, you know, if you say, I want to build um, smart contracts for, for IOTA, but you've never, you've never ever um, written a line of code, then it's probably not going to get funded, right? So, we look at the match between the person and the project, um, and also whether the project has, um, has clear deliverables, because, uh, you know, for grant writing purposes, we, we have to, because we are a regulated nonprofit foundation, we have to account for how we've used our money at the end of each year, and we have to give a report to the Finanzamt uh, to prove that we have used all the money in accordance with our nonprofit purposes. Um, and which, you know, the purposes of, of, of the foundation are basically to, uh, for research, development, and education around distributed ledger, open source distributed ledger technologies. It does have to be open source, um, that is one requirement. You don't have to build it open source as you're building it, but you have to be willing to open source it when you turn it in. Okay, so um, you do not really have, uh, you're not having a criteria, let's say um, you already need an MVP for it or um, no, so in the, in the, within the foundation's main structures, in the adoption stream, we already know the things that, that we want to focus on as strategic priorities for us, and so we can use the foundation funds to do that in a strategic way with a team that's dedicated to that. The ecosystem fund really is meant to encourage anyone to do anything, because there are a lot of people out there with ideas that we would never come up with, um, who maybe just need a little bit of help to, to have some resources to build it with. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anna. I'm from a big net tech company, and I would be interested to know if you have any projects going on in the net tech area. In med tech? Med tech, yes. Med -tech. Yeah, um, producing and selling uh, endoscopy devices, for example, mm -hmm. um, for its leading company. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just interested if you're doing something in that field. Yeah, definitely. So we, have a, we do have an, um, um, a health stream that we is a, fo a major focus within the foundation. And that work is led by a, a medical doctor in London, uh, who is um, he's a trained doctor, he's a practicing physician as well, and he also teaches uh, at University of College London, I'm pretty sure it's UCL Medical School. And, um, and he also is a programmer and uh, develops medical technology. Uh, so he leads the, the health stream. And if, if you want to talk to someone, I can put you in contact with him. Lovely. I've got the microphone now. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, we're running a little late and we had to cut the last question off. If you do have other questions or just like to talk, I think Julie will be around for like 10 minutes at least. Um, here's her contact information um, and we will get on with the program now.